Hi everyone and welcome back to Tokyo on Fire. Today is August 21st, 2017. The Japanese government has been considering for quite a while the integration of the gambling laws of Japan to allow for, for example, integrated resorts. My guest today is Michael Penn. He is the editor of Shingetsu News and a renowned authority on the gambling law here in Japan. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. It's great, and this issue is right up your alley. I know Shingetsu News writes about Japanese politics. It writes about a lot of different things. I'm on your subscription list, and we follow you very closely. Great job. Thank you. Although I should mention that uh, most of my writing on the IR issue is for Asia Gaming Brief, so uh, they do a lot of great work, too. Okay. Well, um, I think of, of all the journalists here in town, you have captured the pole position on discussing and examining the lobby and the initiative for having integrated resorts here in Japan. Let's talk a little bit about first gambling here in Japan. Right. Anybody that spends any time, you don't even need to spend much time here to know about pachinko. Pachinko is uh, kind of a regulated, unregulated way of gambling and it's very popular. It's in all the cities. Also paramutual betting. Ah, uh, Yes, well uh, there is a lot of gambling already going on in Japan as you say. Uh, there's for example horse racing and boat racing uh, and bicycle racing. Uh, but uh, the big, uh, you know, the big monster out there is definitely pachinko, uh, and this is one of the huge issues in terms of bringing the IRs or integrated resorts into Japan because pachinko has a lot of unresolved problems. Uh, one of them being that it's not recognized officially as a form of gambling at all, even though it's the source of most of the gambling problems in Japan. Right. Officially, it's classified as a leisure activity. And because of that, it's been able to get around a lot of the restrictions uh, that have been uh, you know, placed on other forms of gambling. And it means that Japan's infrastructure for dealing with gambling addiction has not matched uh, the scope of the real problem here. How big is the market? Do you have a, a, a number that we can kind of wrap our, our head around? Uh, I don't have that figure off the top of my head, but it is, it's a substantial number. And is it... Accurate to say that the money that is generated through uh, Pachinko is um, somewhat hidden from the authorities? Well, uh, I, I wouldn't say that because actually the Pachinko industry now is quite integrated with the, uh, the police, actually. So uh, it's not uncommon for that when police uh, executives retire, uh, they, they have the some oversight yes. or, or some position in, in, the, uh, in the Pachinko A industry. A cozy relationship. It is, and it, there's, uh, there's definitely some questionable aspects to that because, you know, the police agencies kind of have an interest in protecting the, uh, the pachinko industry's profits, uh, and this is one, probably one of the sources of, of its sort of uh, somewhat loose regulation. What about the issue of the North Koreans siphoning some money? Because a lot of the pachinko, it is said, that a lot of the pachinko parlors are run by uh, Koreans or by uh, Yakuza, and that money is siphoned off in exchange for whatever else goods and services uh, uh, you can think of. Yeah, this has been an issue for, for decades. Uh, as I understand it, quite a bit of money uh, is thought to have been sort of funneled to North Korea from the Japanese economy, a lot of it through uh, pachinko parlors. Uh, I would expect that uh, you know, if we did have the, know the details, we'd probably find that as time has gone by, this you know th those those uh, taps have been tightened in a sense because the Japanese government uh, has gotten more serious about cracking down on, on mm -hmm. North Korean finance. Right. So it's probably not at the same kind of scope of an issue as it was some decades ago. But still, uh, this is something that's well known about the pachinko industry is that it does have a North Korean connection. Right. Paramutual betting, the horse races, the boat races. The boat races recently have been really ramping up on their television advertising and doing a really good job and very attractive. Makes you want to go out and kind of go watch the boat races, but they don't really tell you, you know, overtly about the gambling aspects of it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's, uh, you know, especially in some uh, rural parts of Japan, uh, these can be big issues. I, I used to work at a university and uh, the name of the station was in front of the uh, ho horse track. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this was that's also the, the university the... station, right? Uh. Keibajo Mai in Japanese. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and so, you know, at that station you'd see uh, floods of, uh, of usually older and middle-aged men going, mm -hmm. going to do their, their betting at the horse track. And uh, the advertising is everywhere. Right. Uh, although this probably won't be the case uh, if, the, uh, if the casinos are open. They're, they're discussing a complete ban on advertising uh, 
uh, outside of the facility itself. But it's not clear if that will uh, extend to television advertising or not. But okay. Certainly the billboards won't, won't be there. Okay, so one of the main issues on uh, accommodating, for example, a casino law, casino bill, or maybe allow integrated resorts to, to come in with a certain portion of the, the overall design to be casinos. The, the, the issue is how do you accommodate the pachinko in that kind of a, a gambling environment? And maybe one of the issues is that pachinko needs to go away and that they are integrated into the resort community. Is that the, is that the issue? Well, I don't think the pachinko is going to go away because there's just too much money. It's too much of an industry that's established here. There's too many interests already involved. And, and when I've talked to politicians about it, you know, usually they start to get kind of hemmy and hawy when you start mentioning pachinko because, you know, there's it's a, it's an established interest. Right. And anybody who's an established interest has an advantage over They're theoretical their way interests, too. right? Right. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it is clear that uh, that pachinko is going to have probably some blowback effects of the creation of these IRs, and it's already started to happen. So, uh, for example... They need to clean their act. Well, in particular, there's a, the, one of the major criticisms and, and, uh, uh, of the public towards the opening of the IRs is the fears of gambling addiction. And so, you know, a lot of people, anybody who studies gambling addiction in Japan will tell you, yeah, and it's 90% pachinko problem. Mm -hmm. And so any tougher legislation, any serious public scrutiny of the, uh, of the gambling addiction issue is going to have blowback effects of tighter regulation uh, and, and more restrictions on pachinko. Let's talk about the gambling addiction. I mean, if you do a, a survey of gambling addiction in various countries, the, J the Japanese don't come up as, you know, more gamble ready than other people. But there's probably a certain percentage throughout the globe, throughout whatever um, cultures you're gonna look at, that say maybe three or four percent are susceptible to that kind of a, attraction. Right. And then what you're saying is since Pachinko is so available, it's so loud, it's so noisy, there's lots of action, you can get lost in that, in that kind of loop, and that attracts the others that are kind of sitting on the fence? Yeah, well, uh, to be honest, uh, the Ministry of Health statistics and, and, and sort of anecdotal information from uh, sort of the gambling addiction community, healthcare community, suggests that actually Japan probably does have one of the higher rates of gambling addiction uh, compared to other countries. But it's mostly untreated. It's mostly ignored. Like uh, alcoholism. That's it. I mean, right. and so what happens a lot of times is that uh, families who have an addicted member who's often the, the, the male a businessman in the family, uh, they hide their shame in a sense, mm -hmm. and they try to deal with it within the family uh, quite uh, not very well, but, but they, they don't want it to get out to the public. So it's thought that, that Japan has a very, very serious gambling addiction problem now, but it's mostly untreated, ignored, and, 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 and not undercover. dealt with. Right. right. Let's talk a little bit about integrated resorts. There was a big meeting just last week where they were discussing it. It was not so contentious. Uh, yes. Well, you joined it, didn't you? Uh, I was in the back of the room uh, with a camera, and it, what's what we're talking about here is the beginning of public hearings. Uh, in the autumn diet session, it's expected that what is called the uh, Integrated Resort Implementation Bill will be introduced, which is the second stage of legislation. The first one was exactly one year ago, in, in the end of well, actually the beginning of winter, right? Uh, it was passed in the middle of December. Uh, quite contentiously, uh, the uh, it was done like at one in the middle morning, of the night. That's and, right. Uh, over uh, quite a bit of opposition, um, and now the second stage is going, and the the government is holding nine public hearings around the country. The first one was uh, in uh, was in Tokyo. The second one in Osaka, but it seems like the 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 public hearing. Uh, isn't actually going to have a lot of uh, input from the public. Uh, the, the bureaucrats seem to be uh, rather tightly controlling it, and uh, it, it's more of uh, an opportunity for them to get feedback from various parts of the, the business community. But that said, um, you know, the, the public is interested in the questions that we've seen uh, from surveys and other things. So um, what eventually comes out of those hearings, I would expect, is very little. I don't think that uh, the, the... Because the corporate mind is already made up, we need to have this, this bill, we need to integrate gambling, recognized and regulated gambling in this country? 
I think it's not so much that the corporate mind is made up as the bureaucratic mind is made up. They're, they operate according to their own processes. Mm -hmm. Now, once the enabling legislation was passed last December, the bureaucrats all got involved in the process, and now it's their baby. And uh, so uh, the bill, which eventually comes out, may not have a whole lot of feedback from politicians or the public. It may be basically right. what the bureaucrats decide is the best and then this is what they'll, you know, 90 or 80 percent of what they put out there is what will eventually be in the IR implementation bill. What's the pull here? I mean, why is this a, a big issue? I mean, is it going to really ramp up the, the economic uh, powerhouse that Japan used to be? Or is it, I mean, it's, it's a blip, isn't it? Well, uh, my own uh, opinion is that it's not uh, going to have a huge impact either way uh, to a great deal. But uh, it is being seized upon by Prime Minister Abe, uh, as well as uh, certain parts of the, uh, of the political establishment, and especially the Osaka government, uh, as, uh, as something that will help Economic drive tourism. Okay. Yes. Economic development. And, and the tourism is really, it's taken off. I mean, the, the tourists are loving Japan. They are. And they come in droves, and they, they don't spend as much money as they used to five or, or ten years ago? Uh, it's last two years uh, right. the, the spending has been going down. Yes. Right. So we need to ramp that up and have that's gala shows, it. roller coasters, dancing girls? Right. I mean, that's the idea is it wants to uh, get people to spend more money, uh, both uh, among the, the, the Japanese public and, and the tourists coming in. And uh, it's felt that, uh, you know, you have an integrated resort, which is more than just a casino. It's also uh, theaters and... Uh, various kinds of shows and convention centers and restaurants and all of them basically in one location together shopping. And it's to so you, you could send the, the, the wife off to go do something and the kids mm -hmm. off to do something. And then somebody, and then let's say it happens to be the man, which is usually the case in Japan statistically, right. would go to the casino. But this is just night. a concession though, isn't it? Don't you think what they really wanted was a gambling bill so that we can open a casino? We don't want to have the rest of this stuff and the dancing girls and the elephant that's on a ball. We just want to have regulated gambling so that we can get people from Hong Kong and Singapore coming in, you know, gambling, you know, the night away and mm -hmm. then going back home. That's basically the, the start of the idea, right? It's a big part of it. Uh, I also think the convention centers may be a big part of it too because uh, Japan comparatively has rather small convention centers compared to other Asian countries. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that part of the people who approve of having these is, is they want to do casino gambling here, clearly. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, from the you know, that small percentage, let's say 25% or 20% of the public which does approve of it, they're looking at it as a source of employment for the local community, for driving business revenues, for bringing tourists uh, to their area. So although it's only a minority that, that supports it, uh, that minority is looking mainly at the economic benefits overall. Okay. So would you give it rather high marks that the, the bill will be implemented and integrated resorts will be something that is a part of the Japanese um, business context? Well, I think that uh, the current signs are is that it's going to start off at a fairly modest level. Uh, the, the question is where are these uh, IRs going to be? And uh, mm -hmm. th that, uh, I think that almost everybody agrees Osaka's Yumeshima is going to be uh, one of the big ones. Uh, and you know, this, uh, that will probably be the first one to open as well. Then once you get after that, given the culture of, of Osaka as well, right? It, it, the it's culture, a kind of a, but also you have a business community and a political community which is really invested in this idea, and they really see it as uh, what's going to put them back on the map. I mean, okay, it's been a struggling city for a long time, and they think this is our way to, to get out of that. Sure. Um, but then you know, once you go beyond Osaka, you look at the other possibilities. Yokohama is one of the big city possibilities. Uh, Hokkaido's Tomokomai City, Nagasaki. Some people think, uh, yeah, they have a pretty good shot. Uh, I've talked to other analysts who think, no, it's actually not going to be economically viable to have these ones. So uh, at maximum, they're going to open up three, I think, in the 2020s. Okay. Uh, but it could be as few as one. So it, I don't, you know, it may develop more over time in the second wave in the 2030s or something, 
But uh, I think that the first wave is going to be a little bit smaller than people initially expected. Who are the big players? They're foreigners, aren't they? I mean, it's not, there's no, I mean, I guess there is a, a bit of a, a gambling industry, but it's not the kind of industry that could support or facilitate an integrated resorts kind of concept. That's got to come from maybe the Americans. Who else is doing that, that well the, in Hong Kong? Yeah, um, there are... Uh, in, in Japan, there are companies that, for example, make slot machines and things like this, but they don't have uh, the full uh, capabilities to, to run an IR. So for that, they're definitely sure. going to need foreign expertise. Uh, there's, of course, there's a number of more or less Las Vegas-based uh, companies who are probably going to be the winners. This would be uh, Sands or MGM or uh, Caesars, uh, th these companies. Then there's a few in Macau, like Galaxy and others, uh, who are going to uh, also be bidding. Uh, there's some Australian companies. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, most likely uh, the Japanese government is going to be attracted to, to, to want to have the American companies simply because there's a certain cachet about Las Vegas and, um, and the United States that, that Japanese culture tends to be attracted to. Mm -hmm. So these competitors, these, these houses that are running integrated resorts already, they would have to go into a bidding process and submit the plans and the blueprints and their revenue stream and all sorts of things like that to the Japanese government. And the Japanese government, I guess, would pick a winner and there would be a big press release and then they would get started with construction. Uh, that's, that's the way most countries would do it. But Japan is doing, apparently, from what I understand, something that's never been done in the industry before. I'm very interested to hear <laughs> what, what this might be. Um, the local governments are taking the lead. So in, in, rather than the, these big companies going to the central government and saying, okay, here's, here's our chops, this is what we can offer. Oh, that sounds like easy pickings. Well, yes and no, because a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, the operators don't like this process because it means that first they have to woo a local government and get the local government to accept their, their project. And then the local government goes to the central government and says, okay, we've got, a, we've got our plan together now. Will you authorize us or not? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, some, some operators agree and some disagree. It's like a two-stage uh, thing, which they would rather just have a one-stage thing because they have to spend money. At, at it's huge money. Each, yes, yes, uh, millions of dollars to, to make these. To make, these uh, to make the bids. Right. Just to make the bids. That's right. Right. And so if you make a bid with one local government, and you spend a lot of money on it, and then the central government says, yes, yeah, sorry, we're not going to do anything in that town. We're not going to do Osaka. We're going to go to Yokohama. and For example. Yeah. Although Osaka is almost certainly going to be one of the winners. Okay. But the, um, so that means that you've got all the competitors that are focused on Osaka, so there must be an awful lot of activity going on there, a lot of money changing hands, people setting up offices and you know, looking at plots of land. Uh, you've mentioned that there's a plot of land that's prime for it, yeah, the, the, the uh, Osaka government, each local government is saying this is the area where we're thinking Our about building. Our designated area. Right. right. Uh, so in the case of Osaka, it's Yumeshima, which is a man-made island in Osaka Bay, which uh, right now has like containers and, and, and is an import-export area. They also want to put the 2025 World Expo there if, if they win their bid against Paris. 2025? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but, uh, you know, other other. Small towns uh, also have such plans. Yokohama uh, is talking about putting on Yamashita Pier, mm -hmm. but uh, the, uh, it's not clear that the city government's going to go forward with it because it's such an unpopular thing among the public. Sure. And the mayor just barely, uh, you know, well, she, she won quite decisively, but she went against two opponents who are both hammering her day in and day out on uh, the idea of having a casino, which, you know, three to one, uh, the Yokohama public is against it. Okay, so let's say we, we've gone through the process, we've picked a winner, they have a blueprint, and what is an integrated resort as compared to what a casino is? Yeah, well, my understanding of the history of it is that this term integrated resort really began to be used uh, in the case of Singapore about five or ten years ago. Um, you know, maybe I have a somewhat cynical uh, interpretation of what it means. I think it's mainly to kind of package casino in a, in, in a, in a more uh, Palatable. socially. Yeah, right. 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 Uh, you know, if you say, well, we're going to bring in casinos, and some people are like, oh, casinos. But integrated resort has a softer sound to it. Right. You, it, it more involves, wedding halls. It's more, more, it's, it's more family right. friendly kind of thing. 
So, uh, and then also, like I said, I also think the convention center aspect of it is also important. But you know, you, you mentioned that earlier and it strikes me that uh, Tokyo in particular has tremendous um, convention facilities out in Makahari and right. Odaiba. Right, um, but not meeting the demand. Really? Yeah, and uh, compared to what you would find in, say, uh, Hong Kong or, or Singapore, much smaller. Uh, so uh, from my understanding is, is that comparatively, uh, Japan's a small player uh, on the convention center uh, market. Wow, because yeah. you go out to Odaiba and uh, looks some of big, yeah. it looks huge. <laughs> I mean, the, the auto shows. Uh, but I mean, for example, even for the Olympics, you know, right now they're having a lot of trouble figuring out what to do with that because they wanted to use the, the Tokyo big site as a media center for the Olympics, but the, the, the people who are doing the conventions are complaining because there's no alternative site for them to move to to hold the conventions if that one's not available. Right. So you can see there's, you know, compared to the amount of demand, uh, apparently the, 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 the convention centers that we have currently are not quite sufficient. You know, the Tokyo Olympics in 2020 is designed to be an Olympics on the water. And I had thought that one of the reasons why the integrated resort idea was being promoted so strongly was because this is a second use of a, a facility that's already been, been built. And if that was in fact what was happening, that the integrated resorts would be willing to make the for example, the, the rooms for the, the athletes, a little bit more opulent, mm. even though they're going to be there for two weeks, you know, so that it had a, 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 a turnover effect. But that doesn't seem to be the case. No, it's definitely not going to be the case because uh, probably the first integrated resort won't open until 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there was uh, originally hope that, the, uh, that these first ones might open at the time of the Olympics or before the Olympics. No, no. But that's yeah. now off the sure. table. Sure. So it, this is, but it is, it could be seen as a second part of the growth strategy if you think that the Abe administration says, okay, we have the Olympics and we have this big construction boom leading up to the Olympics. Right. And then there's a fall off. There is a fall. Right. And but land the, prices but, will fall. And but these IRs could be part of their strategy to, to, to uh, mitigate that, that fall off and to give big projects for the big construction companies to get involved in. But you don't give high marks for Tokyo. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Tokyo, uh, I just don't think it's going to bid uh, at this point because uh, uh, Governor Koike has too much on her plate already. She's got to prepare for the Olympics mm -hmm. and then to try to deal with the, and then she has her financial center plan as well. And then you add on top of that uh, a very contentious and unpopular bid to try to open up a casino. Uh, no, I, I just don't see her uh, having the, the bandwidth to deal with that. Okay. These projects are massive. They're really huge. You've got hotel complexes, you've got casino, you've got uh, theaters, and maybe even live performance theaters as well. How much of what they might be able to project um, for, for the land use is actually going to be dedicated for gambling and maybe even paramutual betting, that sort of thing? They, they want to bring it all in, into one house, right? Uh, well, I don't think that the, the betting side is going, I think it's going to be kept completely separate. But the, uh, the casino, uh, the size of the casino is one of the contentious issues which is now being discussed by the regulators and will be in the bill. Uh, the, the, the Japanese government's view seems to be that by limiting the size of the casino and making it more difficult to enter the casino and by, you know, putting various regulations on it that they can reduce the amount of gambling addiction, which is a the public's main concern. Also, they're worried about money laundering and they're worried about, uh, you know, a breakdown of, of public security. And uh, morals. And right. morals, yes. Right. Uh, so what's now being contemplated is that if they build an IR, uh, a maximum of perhaps 3% of that area will be dedicated to the casino. That seems tiny. It may be a problem. Uh, the... Uh, that's by floor space? Yes. Okay. Yes, correct. And uh, I have talked to some analysts who believe that, that this rule of uh, limiting it to 3% may end up making the regional uh, IRs, uh, for example, in Hokkaido or Nagasaki, not viable. Uh, so uh, the question is, I don't know if that's true or not, but some, people, some analysts are saying that if they stick to this limit of 3%, they're going to make sure that the IRs can't happen in very many places except for the big urban cities. Mm -hmm. And the only big urban city which is aggressively bidding right now is Osaka. 
Okay. So you've got um, a casino floor space of maybe 3%. How does that compare to Las Vegas or, or maybe Macau or any uh, of these other places? It's probably fairly comparable. But, oh, really? Yeah. But, okay. the, uh, uh, but the thing is, is that those facilities are quite huge. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, in places like Las Vegas and Macau, they have, you know, a lot of space where these things were built on. Mm -hmm. um, right. But, uh, you know, the model for a lot of what Japan is doing is, is actually Singapore. Because Singapore went through a similar process five or ten years ago. And their, uh, their model is, is seen by the Japanese to have been a success that they would like to emulate. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the money. I mean, uh, they're going to be generating money and paying taxes on that money, obviously. Correct. A lot of taxes. Right. So that they can get the concession. Mm -hmm. But who, is, who are the gamblers? I mean, are they the whales that we're looking for? Or is it the regular Japanese who are going to have their, their wedding ceremony there and then they're going to do a little bit of gambling? They're going to have their you know, the, the convention of, you know, people who wear funny hats and then they're going to do some gambling. Is that the, the rollout, you think? The Japanese government is mostly interested in, in using these IRs to boost foreign tourism. Uh, the people who are in the uh, gaming industry say, yeah, it'll, it'll, that'll happen some, but the main part of the, the people who are there are going to be Japanese people, Jap Japan residents who live in the area. So domestic, they're looking more at the domestic market. There's a little bit of cross-purposes there. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I think that uh, evidence in, in similar markets suggests that it's going to be largely Japanese who visit these Japanese IRs. You would think. Yeah, right. and probably 70 or 80%. Uh, and, and you mentioned about um, maybe keeping the doorway tight, that means that you have to register or you have to qualify in order to go into the complex itself or just into the, the, the gambling part of it? The controls which are currently being proposed by the government is that first of all to get in you have to show your My Number card. Okay. And the thing is right now only about 9% of the public has a My Number card. Okay, but that's going to change, sure. It's going to change, but even still the Osaka government just, just last week was complaining. They're saying, why on earth are you requiring the use of a system which may not be fully in place by that time. So this is so, so there are complaints about this, but okay. it's because there's some sort of IC chip so they can they can keep better control. And then the other control which they're talking about is to limit the uh, number of times that you can enter a casino per month or, or per a certain number of times. You get in, you you have 24 hours to play around maybe, but you only do that a certain number of times per month. This is meant to be a, a control against gambling addiction. How about that? And to get in the door, uh, if you're a Japan resident, foreigner or Japanese, you're probably going to have to pay six, seven, eight thousand yen uh, to get into casino. An entrance fee. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so these are these are the various controls that the Japanese government is talking about right now. To get back to one of your other questions from before, the profile of the of the customer, uh, it's in this case it's mostly going to be mass market, I think. Uh, there are sort of, you know, the, the so-called, you know, the, the, the big wheels and, and the big people. Um, that will be part of the market, but probably a, a smaller part of the Japanese market as, a pair, as compared to Macau and other places. So if Japan was really going for the big wheels, they would be aggressively what they call junkets, where they, uh -huh. they, they basically have these things organized and then they bring the, bring the big wheels in. But uh, in the case of Japan, they're gonna ban junkets altogether, which means that it's, it's mass market focused. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how about the money laundering aspect of this? Maybe it's a little bit premature because a, a lot needs to be figured out already, but money laundering is really a, it's a, it's a tough issue here. Even if you're going to be receiving a remittance from anywhere else in the world into your Japanese bank account, the bank calls you up, you have to go through a list of questions before they release those funds into your, your bank account. So for, for an integrated resort or, or for a casino, to be able to move that money and clean that money and get, you know, clean money back out, I think is a really attractive thing for the, the people who are kind of twisted in that, that direction. Well, yes, uh, this has been one of the major concerns in putting together legislation. And they're, they're going at it from a number of different directions. First of all, from the point of view of the customer, uh, there's not going to be any ATM apparently inside the facility. Oh, so you'll have to go in with your cash, and you've got to bring the briefcase with you. That's right. And so when you how pedestrian? So we, when that money runs out, you're 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 out of luck. 
Uh, literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, uh, in terms of how to regulate the, the, the casino operators, which of course is where the really big money is, uh, the Japanese government is going to set up a whole new uh, agency. Uh, the, the English uh, title for the agency hasn't been set yet, but it'll be something like Casino Management Board. So there'll be another position within the Prime Minister's cabinet? We've got to put another chair in there? There will be an agency, sort of like the... Right. Uh, it'll be under the, ca uh, the cabinet office. Uh, it'll be sort of like the, the Free Trade uh, Commission or something okay, like that. Okay, it's a baby step. It's, it's like even the, the casinos themselves. It's, it's a baby step. Maybe it's going to be 3%, hmm. but maybe it's going to be greater. We just need to have a couple of trials, see how it rolls out, let people get a little bit more calm about it, show them that you know it doesn't create or facilitate more gambling addiction. It doesn't really enhance more money laundering. It's a trial, and it's something that kind of represents Japan in a nice way, so let's do two or three more. Well, I think that uh, almost everybody expects there's going to be an evolution on the policy. Uh, so the rollout, as you say, may be smaller and more restrictive, and then once uh, you know, the, the, the public gets more comfortable with mm -hmm. it, once the government learns what they're doing more, then they may, you know, loosen things up and say the 2030s. Right. But the, um, but there will there will be an evolution. This casino management board will be filled with lawyers and accountants who are going to be going through all of the things in quite more detail than, than the Japanese government normally does. Mm. So, like in a lot of other places, I think that this IR casino industry will be more heavily regulated. Uh, and more heavily taxed mm -hmm. uh, than is the case for probably almost any other industry in Japan. Sorry to go back. How does this impact the pachinko industry? Mm. Could, could you well, elaborate a little bit more on that? Because there, there's not a city in Japan, even a rural community, that doesn't have a pachinko parlor. It's open all the time. The neon lights, the sound, it is just... It's a, it's a beehive of activity when everybody else is planting, you know, rice or corn or going to sleep at 8 o'clock in, in the evening. Right. Well, I think that's why Pachinko is going to do fine because uh, it's there in your it's neighborhood. It's embedded. It's right there at your station coming home from work. Mm -hmm. You know, the, to go to one of these IRs, it's going to be a special vacation, you know, to pull out the family, to travel probably a long so way to get to it. So it's not that much of a threat? To the pachinko industry? I think? don't think so, really. Okay. Uh, but the pachinko industry's main threat is the fact that the population's already getting smaller. The, every year, the pachinko industry is getting, uh, losing money. They're now down to just over 10,000 pachinko parlors. This is down from like almost 20,000 in 1995. So, uh, you know, the pachinko industry is going to be heading in a bad direction, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's going to be the IRs that are going to, to kill it. I think it'll still be there. But it's going to get smaller because the population's getting smaller, and the regulation uh, mm -hmm. might get tougher because uh, with the public concern about gambling addiction and the IRs, it means that they're, the government's not going to be able to completely ignore what's going on with, with the pachinko parlors, too. But it's not so much about capturing that revenue. I don't think, I think they will function as a somewhat different market. Uh, and I just don't think that the IRs are going to be numerous enough. Uh, to to really be a threat to the to the national uh -huh. pachinko market. Okay, but I mean the reason why we're doing this episode on IRs is because it is a pretty big deal. Wouldn't you agree? It's a big deal in terms of of the size and the potential impact it has on the entertainment industry, for example. Yes. Well, it means that uh, a lot of uh, entertainment facilities may become centralized in these IRs. I mean that's their whole concept. Uh, and it may bring, for example, you know, music acts and other kinds of things that, that currently don't visit Japan so much to, into these. Maybe it facilitates you know, having uh, the city a 24-hour city, too, because there, there are no 24-hour cities in Japan. This is a big part of it. Uh, you know, the, one of the uh, issues which uh, Japanese uh, big city leaders especially have been dealing with is they're like, Okay, everything, even in Tokyo, which is the largest urban area in the world with 35, 36 million people, you know, by midnight it's shutting down, That's right? right? And so th it's been recognized that, that this would be uh, of economic benefit if there was still a lot of livelihood, a lot of action going on in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Most major cities in the world have this. Japan doesn't. Japan still kind of operates like a village. And so this is something which uh, could change mm -hmm. with, uh, if the IRs become uh, more established uh, in many parts of the nation. The most critical issue I've 
I've got to say, must be the land. Where are you going to get a piece of land integrated, a chunk of land that would be able to support such a massive one so that 3% of that can be devoted to, you know, churning the money? Where they seem to be, uh, the local governments which are raising their hand and saying, we want one, are almost all right next to a major airport. Uh, so, uh, mm -hmm. and oftentimes on artificial islands or on areas that have been just built up as an airport. So, uh, you know, even uh, the Chubu, uh, they also have an artificial island airport they opened up recently. They, they're thinking now about trying to, have, to bid for an IR there, although they probably will have a difficulty to win that bid. Uh, in the case of Hokkaido, uh, Tomokomai is, is right next to Chitose Airport. Uh, it hosts that. Uh, and in the case of uh, Osaka, again, a, a big artificial island, which... What about a floating island? A flo well, I, I think... Uh, like like a, uh, not even a, a, a cruise ship, something that's actually fitted out to be a, a kind of integrated resort on the water. So far, this hasn't been part of the concept. Okay. Uh, but the... It's uh, too small? Well, I, I think, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I think that generally right now they're thinking about... Uh, just letting the local governments decide which part of their town uh, hmm. can be used for this. In the case of Yokohama, you know, they have this uh, Yamashita Pier, which currently is being used for, like, again, containers, right? Import, export stuff. I guess they're going to get rid of that, that, that contain, container facility and turn it into a giant entertainment facility. But where would all the fire ants go if we did that? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> but, but I imagine there must be smaller ports which can take up the slack. But that's huge, though. I mean, that facility is, is huge. I mean, you can see it from Tokyo Tower. It just dominates the, the skyline. That's right. Uh, I, I, I'm not exactly sure where they're planning to move it to, but it does seem that the local governments feel that, that they can... They want to reuse that space and redevelop it, probably because it's right next to this huge population. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have this huge population, they go down to the beach, you're not going to want to see a bunch of cranes and container ships, right? right. You're going to want to see something more attractive. And they're, they're envisioning Japan. I mean, the one part of Abenomics and the Japanese economy, which is really booming, is tourism. Mm -hmm. This is the one thing that, that is, a, is an unadulterated success. And so... This is where they, they want to move things in the future to make Japan a much more uh, attractive, powerful, tourism-driven economy. Right. Well, people aren't coming here for paramutual betting or for the pachinko. They're coming here for the food culture, for anime, for other things like that. And, and so that'll be there. Okay. They're, 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 they want to make these integrated resorts very Japanese. There'll be like probably things like dancing and different cultural events, which will be introducing Japanese culture to foreign tourists and things like this. So that's also part of the concept. It's to make it, okay. to make these not simply like, you know, going a to Las A substitute for? It'll be bringing it all together, a tourist facility to introduce Japan, to have entertainment, to have hotel rooms, all in one space. That's huge. That is really, I mean, the, the, the technologies that need to go into to kind of incorporate that is... That's massive. It'll be big business. So talking about the big players, you've mentioned MGM as one of the big players, the Sands. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a company in uh, Macau that you mentioned. Galaxy. Galaxy. Caesars uh, in, in the United States Caesars, as well. right. So um, apparently this is such a big business for them that they're really putting their money where their mouth is, and they've got resources here. They've opened up offices. Jason Hyland, who was the um, acting ambassador to Japan in between the departure of Caroline Kennedy and the arrival just last week of William Haggerty, he was just tapped as the leader for MGM's effort here in Japan. That's a huge issue. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, MGM, I think, uh, in terms of building a team inside of Japan, seems to be ahead of some of the others. Uh, they're, they're putting together a team with a lot of firepower. And you no know, kidding. nobody has, you know, uh, has gone after somebody as sort of high level and connected in Japan as, as he is. Right. Um, a lot, Sands is also thought to be uh, a major player. Many people have speculated that they, they have Osaka locked up. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's the case, but, uh, but that speculation has gone around. Uh, in terms of the interest among the gaming industry, if you go back, I don't know, four, five, six months ago, there were some really big statements being made by the gaming industry leaders who are saying things like, 
yes, we'll, we're willing to spend $10 billion sure, they're, they're or trying whatever to, we they're take. They're trying to, to carve public opinion, right? Well, they're also saying that the, you know, Japan was seen, at least briefly, as being the, 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 the new promised land. In a sense, it could be a market second in Asia only to Macau. Mm. Uh, but uh, now there's that, some of that optimism is worn off when they, they began to get the feeling that the Japanese government's much more concerned about tight, tight regulation, and now they're getting worried about the terms of the, of the investment being so harsh right. that they may not be able to make the revenues they were, they were initially expecting. But it's all up in the air right now. Well, we've had experience here before. Universal Studios opened a, a, a big site in Osaka. They took over a, a really um, nasty uh, shipbuilding area. They had a lot of problems there. They built it, they designed it, and it looks like it had a real rough start. Yeah, but also I believe that that site is very close to where they're thinking about building the IR as well. So uh, there might be some sort of uh, mutual benefit uh, among, among the sites there. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I mean, obviously uh, there's been many other you know, pod projects of great pitch and moment which, which haven't played out uh, right. the way things have, have been hoped. Uh, but, uh, you know, my own feeling is that there's going to be some rough spots here, particularly on the regulation side of things where the Japanese government doesn't have experience with this and they don't really know what they're doing. They don't know what policies. Perhaps, right? Yeah, but, you know, they're also being getting demands from the public to be really serious about mm -hmm. this, and they are being serious about it. So my own feeling is, is that there's going to be a, a series of refinements over time, right. and they're going to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And, and, you know, I have faith that they'll muddle through, but the process may not be so, um, you know, so elegant right from the beginning. What a coup for the winner, though. Let's say, for example, it's, it's one of the American players, MGM, and uh, they come in and they've got the concession. How, I mean, what a brand boost that would be for them uh, yes. to be MGM in Japan with this casino, and then it just it helps them leverage everything else. The shows that they've got in Las Vegas, they can ship over here. It just increases their pipeline. Yeah, all the big operators have their eyes on that. Uh, it, it will be a very big project. Uh, most of the you know the, the industry analysis is talking about you know revenues of five, six billion dollars a year for each one of the major urban ones. Uh, the regional ones may be more in the five hundred million range. So. Um, it's, uh, uh, yes, so for example, to take Caesars as an example, uh, you know, they're big in the United States, but they haven't really developed mm -hmm. an Asian presence yet. And so they really want this project from their point of view, because this, this would really suddenly make them a truly more global company. Learn by right? mistaking. Right. What about MGM? It's got global reach? Yes, they already have quite a few, uh, uh, even in Asia. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, they're right up there in the top two or three uh, who really want this Japan Sands. project. Sands is another one. Uh, they have the, the major project in Singapore already, and so this is mm. part of their sales pitch. Okay. But Sands is a little different because uh, it's kind of ruled more like a kingdom, more top-down mm -hmm. than, than, than some of the other companies which are more corporate in their culture. Right. What an amazing episode this has been. I really appreciate it, Michael. How can viewers who are interested in the casino law, where it is, and, and the IR a concept. How can they learn more about it by contacting you? Right. Well, I, I'm covering Japanese politics on a daily basis for my own Shingetsu news, but in terms of the specific issue of the casino and the IRs, I'm writing uh, short articles four or five times a week for Asia Gaming Brief. That's a lot. Uh, I, yes. I mean, basically every night I have to go home and figure out what's going on that's new. Um, and so uh, this is all online, Asia Gaming Brief. They also have a, a print magazine. They're based in Macau. And they're one of the you know a handful of uh, gaming industry magazines, which is covering not just Japan but uh, all of Asia. But I'm their Japan correspondent, focusing uh, very closely on the Japan side. So our viewers can kind of plug into what you're producing on a daily basis, and it doesn't cost them anything. It's on the web. Uh, for the Asia Gaming Brief, the daily reports are, are free. Um, uh, they do have uh, every week uh, some uh, deeper intelligence analyst pieces, which uh, you have to become subscribers to read. But the bulk of what uh, I produce is available freely on the web. Well, we're going to put that in the description below this video, so please stay tuned to that. Michael, thank you very much for joining us today. The casino law and the integrated resorts coming to Japan, it's pretty much a done deal, but there's an awful lot left in the making. Please stay tuned.